All right, thank you um, everyone for um, coming back or if you're new, thank you for attending. But this is um, of course on resolving con conflict. It's the second of three classes that have been designed for IETF working group chairs. Um, and I know I mentioned this the last time, but the development of these classes was highly collaborative with an IETF working group that included current and former working group chairs. Uh, my name is Dewana Williamson. I'm excited to be here with you um, this morning. I also, or I'm sorry, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, I am in Frisco, Texas, just north of Dallas. I also led the training that was conducted last year. And while the topics are same, the, tra the trainings have received an intense makeover and it's my hope that they will that the training will resonate with all of you all. Is there anyone attending who was not here last Monday? And if so, can you just tell us, um, say your name, where you are and how long you've been a working group chair? Is there anyone new this week? Okay, I'll take that as a as a no. Um, again, it's um, my plan is for this class to be highly um, interactive, and the slides are content dense. So I'll just highlight points, and then you're welcome to jump in if you have questions or have points that you want to elaborate on. Um, and we found that the value, the most value in the class is not me talking, it's actually you all talking um, to each other. So um, I am hoping that you are prepared to, um, to contribute and, and lift up a, additional points. You all know this work um, a lot more personally than, than I do. Um, so it will really benefit the group if you are um, interactive and, and raise points um, in order for others to um, weigh in and, and speak to. So I would really appreciate um, your voices in this today, in this class today. So on the agenda, we're going to talk about the anatomy of conflict, um, functional versus dysfunctional conflict. Um, fostering conflict resolution um, in the IET spe IETF specific working group conflict. And then we'll have a, um, a you'll see a video at the end that is a, a basically a case study, but you'll watch the video and then we'll um, have a discussion, um, discussion about that. All right, let's talk about anatomy. Again, these, these early slides are really more about, you know, theoretically what conflict is, but we will jump into the IETF specific um, things that I'm sure that uh, what all of you all are here for. Conflict, uh, I'm gonna, this is the only, I promise this is the only slide I'll read, but I am gonna read this one word word for word, but conflict naturally occurs when people possess divergent ideas, needs, and wants. Um, conflict is a normal and necessary part of innovation and teamwork, and every group will inevitably experience it. When conflict is harnessed and managed, it becomes a powerful tool for nurturing creative ideas, inspiring participation, and opening communication. So many of us have been taught to avoid conflict in personal and professional settings. Um, and now recently there is more content evolving around um, how we should embrace con conflict and seeing it as a necessary component of iterating on and improving um, processes. So it's not, um, I know many of us have had this negative view, and I think there are different ways to think about conflict, and we should understand like what is what is actually good conflict and what is conflict that is detrimental to the goals that we're trying to accomplish. 
So there are a lot of different like frameworks for um, for conflict, and I this is this is the one that that I like, so it is the one that I am lifting. But this one um, says that there are five phases of conflict, and so there is the prelude to it, which are all the factors which create conflict with individuals. Like it could be, you know, lack of coordination, differences in um, and interests, it could be cultural differences, educational background, like all of those things can actually be the, can create conflict among um, individuals. And I know with the diversity that is within the IETF, I'm sure that these things play into um, some of the conflict that you all um, probably see on a regular basis. And then no conflict can arise on its own. So there has to be an event that triggers it. Um, and this is just a, a, a basic e example, but Jenny and Ali never got along very well with each other. They were from different cultural backgrounds, which is a very strong factor for the possibility of a conflict. Ali was in the middle of a presentation when Jenny stood up and criticized him for the lack of relevant content in his presentation. And this triggered the conflict between them. I'm sure that you all have seen this. Someone stands up um, and says something and everybody or others begin to, you know, jump in and it causes a tense situation or people disagree and it causes a tense situation. So the conflict has already begun um, in the initiation phase. And this is when there are the arguments, the disagreements, um, and it's just the, the sign that the fight has, has begun. Differentiation phase is when the individuals voice their differences against each other or voice their differences against the idea and the reasons for the, the conflict are raised at this point. An unresolved conflict can lead to less than optimal solutions. It can lead to people making decisions just to like in the discussion or in the, the conversation or to, you know, end the, the issue in, um, in, in general. And I guess we, we can call that capitulating, right? Just saying for forget it for the sake of moving forward. And the resolution phase is when individuals must try to compromise to some extent and resolve the conflict soon. Um, and the res resolution phase explores the various options to resolve the conflict. There are um, many sources of, of conflict. Um, it, it can come from several sources and some of it can be the basis in how people behave. And while others come um, from disagreements about the nature of the work and how it's, how it's being accomplished. So it can come um, from the work itself as well. There can be various reasons or sources of conflict, and we'll talk about some general ones here, and then later in our discussion, we'll talk more about conflict that's specific to the work that you all do. So one thing, people can have competing interests, right? When people have mutually incompatible desires or needs, um, they that conflict can come out of those um, those situations, and people have different styles and preferences, and they clash over, you know, how they say things, work habits, the attention, the detail, how something is communicated. right? Their differences and ideas, and that um, causes conflict as well. And but this conflict can be. Um, it can inhibit collaboration, which is um, which can be an issue. Um, I can, yes, I can get the, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing this, Susan. I can get the references for the anatomy of conflict. <clears throat> I don't think they're in, I don't have them directly in my notes, but I can make sure that they're um, included as a part of the follow-up to the class. Sources of um, their additional, 
sources of conflict and they can come from like failure to follow working group norms if you have norms. So like if a, if a member of the group doesn't work um, in alignment with how the group typically works, that can cause can can cause um, conflict. And then like performance differences or deficiencies when people don't hold up their end of the bargain, when they don't do what they say they're going to do, or they don't do it within the time that they said they were going to do it, that can cause um, friction and can um, cause visible conflict. Also, there's poor communication when um, the working group is not clear um, or relevant information is not shared with, um, with individuals that can cause um, conflict and it becomes, becomes blame and people have, have different motives and it can just become a whole big thing. And then, and also ambiguity and lack of clarity can result in conflict. When people aren't clear, it can cause them to make that are not accurate and it can ultimately slow down the process of getting to the best solution. Okay, now it's time. I am done talking for a few minutes. I would love for you all to um, think about these two questions and jump in, but what are some of the causes of working group conflict that you have experienced how did it how did it impact what you were trying to accomplish in the working group? I know you all have had working group conflict. And I'm struggling because I can't see anybody's face. Everybody's off camera. Um, I have a, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hi. Uh, I have an example of, well, it's not so much an explicit conflict, but I guess it is a conflict. And the example I have in my head is that uh, there's a draft that's being worked on by a group of people. And there's one or a few people reviewing it. But essentially, one of the reviewers keeps sending it back and back and back and back, even though all the other reviewers have already uh, agreed that the draft is good. It's just one of the reviewers is consistently sending it back for constantly new issues sometimes, and sometimes just minor modifications to the previous one. And to an extent, those it's not like they're not coming out of nowhere. So mm -hmm. there is some justification. But to an extent, also, a lot of it is, I would also argue that uh, because that reviewer also takes time with each response, this is prolonging the entire process by quite a long time. And uh, so it's not an explicit one, but I mm -hmm. would call that actually a conflict because I to an extent, I can see the frustration of the editors because at some point they just stop responding for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so um, that's an example uh, in the working group I've seen. So it's basically slowing the working group down. People are frustrated because things aren't moving quickly enough. Uh, yeah, it's essentially the way I see it is it's kind of blocking work from happening. And if it at least was fast iterations, there'd probably be no problem with that. But the iterations are spread over several months. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I, because it's not an explicit conflict, it's very hard actually, I find to actually just jump in and say something because yeah. there's no explicit conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, does anyone else, would anybody contribute or has have had a similar situation? Should I just in jump some... in? I'm yes, sorry. please. Um, so I'm on the other end of it. I'm the reviewer trying to push through 
uh, trying to review a draft. And um, it's probably not exactly the same thing, but I'm the reviewer for another working group. I'm a working group chair and it's an inter-working group review. Uh, some working groups, uh, the one are, are linked together because of subject. I'm the reviewer trying to get the process working faster. I'm reviewing and we have a lot of lag from the editor. So I'm in the same situation, but I'm the reviewer saying, I'm reviewing it. It's still got problems. These are major problems that I can't let go. It has resulted in a conflict. Um, and I can go on from there, but I'm just echoing that there are this con this type of conflict occurs both from the chairs seeing mm -hmm. the reviewer take a long time mm -hmm. and from the reviewer trying to push the review and you see a pause or things that aren't reviewing. So this, I just wanted to substantiate, this is a problem and this creates conflicts. Okay, we, I think um, when we get, I'm gonna talk about functional versus dysfunctional conflict. And then I think we'll have um, some time to kind of explore like what has worked for people um, in these situations. So I will try to move through this, but I do see um, Mirjam's um, comment about what clear deadlines for the reviewers help in this situation. Um, I guess, yes, but there's still the issue that uh, sometimes, even if the reviewer is late, I think it's still valuable to wait for that reviewer. And so whilst the deadline would at least make it clear and acceptable mm -hmm. to send a reminder, mm -hmm. so in that way it would help, uh, mm -hmm. though it would not completely solve the issue, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> It feels like anytime some there people have an expectation of doing something within a, a a specific time frame, it doesn't like always work, but it just feels like it's helpful because at least sometimes they have and they know what the expectation is. Oh, I love that. Sometimes we rely too much on the mailing list and sometimes we need to more directly communicate between reviewers and editors that chairs can facilitate. It's a great point. Okay, let's talk about functional versus dysfunctional. I'll move um, um, through this so we can have more discussion. But in the anatomy of the conflict section, I just talked about how many of us are taught to avoid conflict, um, but it can serve a purpose, right, in getting to, to, to better results. And functional conflict can push the thinking of the working group and result in productive collaboration and, and innovation. And this is why it's important that, that chairs, co-chairs, whomever have um, tools in their toolbox to help manage and transform dysfunctional conflict to functional conflict. And I do, I do want to just make that point that a conflict can start out dysfunctional, but through the work, right, through the conversation, through the iterating on, on different things, it can become functional because it can become a conversation that helps you just improve upon what it is you're working on. But Functional conflict creates space for working group to working groups to address issues and move past them. So it serves as a platform for releasing tension in a um, pr productive way. And it can also be seen as right, a fair fight, right? It is, it is a, a, a fight with ideas and perspectives, which is which can, if it when it's um helpful and productive, can be um can be good for the process or good for the final outcomes and results. And then functional conflict also provides the working group the opportunity to reflect and circle back 
on unresolved issues, right? It, it provides the group an opportunity to think again, to do some self-introspection and to have another look um, at, um, at existing things. And again, it leads to innovation and at times it can lead to a totally new direction. Um, when conflict happens, attention, right, is immediately drawn to the malfunctioning parts of the system or process. Um, and it's just a, it's an indication that the situation calls for improvement and then a deeper analysis, which again can end up um, having a, a better outcome. Uh, so dysfunctional conflict um, is is also known as destructive conflict. So, and it can be detrimental and disastrous, right? It can shut down um, conversations. It can shut down people working to, or it can prevent people from working together. And it, it can ultimately have negative effects on um, individuals, groups, um, and then it diverts your the energy towards things that are that are unproductive, right? You start getting into things that are not helpful to the outcomes that you're trying to um, get to. And and you know, last week we talked about promoting engagement. A lot of dysfunctional conflict can actually prevent engagement um, from people. People leave the group. People don't feel safe to um, provide their thinking and ideas. And some people are just more sensitive to this kind of destructive or dysfunctional um, conflict. And you have to be um, aware of that as a co-chair, like who, who, who is ideas. Um, one of the major downsides of dysfunctional conflict, it can consist a lot of time and energy from the cha chairs, um, participants, you know, all just because you're focused, spend a lot of time on. And then again, um, this negative energy of this dysfunctional conflict can cause people to be stressed, <laughs> unhappy, um, and just can cause them to like settle for unformed or bad decisions. It could take the working group to settle for bad or unformed decisions. So have you experienced um, what does functional conflict look like in the in the working group? Um, does someone have an example? It's choppy. Is my audi audio okay? Is this better? Yeah, we just lose some words in between. Otherwise, it's fine. Oh, okay. I I took off the microphone, so you can just let me know if um if that's better. Um. So, with question, where um discussion? Have you experienced functional conflict when leading a work group? Um, do you have an example of that? What happened, and how was it resolved? Uh, one place where I have seen uh, what I would consider as a fun uh, functional conflict is uh, at the initial design time, usually what happens is when you are looking at the architecture, many people have uh, assumptions. And in some cases, they also have uh, like, you know, what they care about the most, what is the most important architectural principle over which they are building. And those assumptions people hold very dear to them. And sometimes they are not very like expressive on this because they hold them so self-prevailing that they would think that everybody else would agree with them as well and they would like you know not be able to state them very clearly so if you guide them and try to ask them to state those principles very well so that other people can understand 
that why the, where they are coming from is sort of very important and asking those prodding questions and getting them to state that so that other people can also expect that yes sometimes what happens is our protocols get deployed in different scenarios and different types of networks and mm -hmm. people are thinking of only the network that they care about and hearing this from multiple point of view and getting that thing out in open would make our protocols run better so that is something that i could think of as a good functional conflict mm -hmm. great any other examples that's a great example does anybody have an example where something like turns out dysfunctional and then actually ended up being a functional conflict? Does that concept resonate with you all or does it just not make sense? <laughs> I will give another example of a functional conflict if I may, Duana. Yes. Uh, we were in the middle of an adoption call uh, one of the, uh, uh, my working group adopts um, uh, point solutions uh, in IDR. And we had an adoption for a bug fix that happens. You get something out the field and it fails. The bug fix ended up over, uh, uh, the fix to it interacted with another draft we'd adopted. The authors argued about it on the mail list, but then went off and did one of the best things. They harmonized and worked on the solution together and came up with a merge solution. That's an example of functional conflict. The conflict occurred, the conflict people got together and collaborated, and we got a better solution. That's a functional conflict. Absolutely. Thank you both for those examples. All right, fostering conflict resolution. This is really about, this section is about just creating the environment to actually be able to resolve conflict. Um, and fostering conflict resolution is just about creating the right environment to be able to work through the conflict, therefore resolving issue and moving towards productive completion of the work. So in order to make conflict a positive partner, you must create the environment for it. So crucial to success in creating this environment are a couple of, um, couple of guiding um, principles and values. So trust um, is a principle and it ensures people feel safe, having differences in opinion and engaging in constructive debate. I imagine this can kind of this can be uh, um, difficult for the IETF, depending on like the size of the working group. I've heard you all um, reference that, so you just have to you know think about it from that perspective. I know sometimes it's hard to build that kind of trust in a in a larger group, um, but the the idea of it is that people know that within the working group it is you know, permissible and necessary to have different ideas and perspectives, right? And they, you know, feel comfortable articulating what those are. They trust the, 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 the process of being in a working group, essentially. Um, the transparency, there are no surprises. People know what to expect, um, ideas and opinions. The working group chairs demonstrate respect for the working group and show respect for each other. I imagine that you are all are pretty respectful of participants, but I can imagine that that may not be all may not always be true with um, participants in the working group. So again, it just kind of goes to that concept of modeling this respect and setting up um, expectations for how the group will work. And that is um, part of like the norms too that I mentioned um, earlier, what are your working group norms? 
um, people feel safe to contribute. That creates this environment for resolving conflicts. Um, there is a way for capturing ideas, and I know that that is ultimately embedded in your in your processes for IETF. But when ideas come up and they they are not relevant for a particular topic, I know that sometimes I'm, I'm calling it a parking lot. I know that you all call it something um, very different, but there is a way to capture it, even though it is not a part of um, your immediate um, problem solving um, process. And I think this is also kind of the power of the mailing list as well. So there is respect all around, again, by the chairs. Um, disrespect is not um, tolerated, and the working group chairs model a positive um, model positive behavior. These are all ways to create an environment of conflict resolution. Um, and th there are ways to like part of this is proactively managing that environment. So the the chair set the tone, you know, for the working group to embrace the conflict of constructive conflict in a sustainable way. So rather than seeing conflict as something to be managed, right, it's owning that it will happen and it is a way to, again, get to, to the best outcomes. And then identify the systemic issues that are causing destructive conflict. So get to the root of it if it's destructive conflict and then work towards um, um, resolving um, those underlying issues. And this is, again, this is how you kind of manage that environment in order to have that um, productive and constructive conflict. Um, address disputes and disagreements as soon as you potentially, as soon as you have open and honest open and honest communication often uh, uncovers differences in a healthy way and they can then be diffused when it's kind of that interpersonal type conflict having you know a side um, interaction with someone who is engaging in that type of conflict in an unhealthy way can help create a, a better environment and encourage a healthy exchange of ideas and needs um, within a respectful and safe environment. So don't like um, help people articulate. I think Daruv was kind of speaking to this, but like help people to um, convey the, the information in detail so that it is understandable, you know, for others. So sometimes helping in that process, again, creates this environment where you can manage um, conflict. And again, as a chair model, providing different, um, different perspectives, empower individuals to give their voice all right. How can um, how can you how can you create or have how have you created a constructive um, conflict environment in your working groups? And how can you redirect dysfunctional conflict into functional conflict? Or are there ways that you have done that? Uh, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, sometimes we have like either it's uh, people who bring in a lot of well-baked uh, documents into the working group. Like they have already done a lot of effort and it's not like a half-baked idea. It's sort of a well-baked idea. And sometimes this even happens with people who are participating in ITF setting for the first time. And when they present and when they get some feedback, they take it as a criticism of their work and they start with a very negative uh, emotion that like, oh, my work is getting criticized and uh, that thing. So I think uh, talking to those folks uh, in advance and setting their uh, expectations that the reason that they are at the ITF is to get feedback and just getting feedback is not negative at all. It's here to help us improve the effort. So that conversation, I think sometimes is needed. And I've seen that that's sort of helpful, especially when the folks who uh, at the other end of the uh, comments. And of course, we should need to do better when we give comments, but mm. also to prepare people that like, you know, they should not take comments as something negative mm -hmm. has been helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, sometimes like I know a lot of times they're just people who are, as we would say, conflict averse, right? And just very uncomfortable with with feedback um, um, in general. So it is, um, I can imagine it is helpful to kind of set expectations and help people um, do that. That's just know that that's a part of the process. Would any, does any, would anybody else can have anything to add to that or have an example? To Drew's comment, uh, some of that uh, first time is first time attendees. Some of that can also be cultural, mm -hmm. and so it does take a discussion with chairs. Sometimes it's even um, the person is working against long term expectations. It's not bad that they're working against long-term expectations, but it does create sometimes conflict. Mm -hmm. And that is long-term expectations in the industry for ways that are done. And perhaps they're a, a new type of network and they need it done a different way. And they're now trying to convince the standards from people who've been doing it a different way that theirs is just as good. It can be conflict uh, rich. So trying to work with those as an individual is, is um, as an individual person, uh, it's really the responsibility of the chairs. We're trying to help those people become uh, a new active force in the ITF. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. I, I mean, I think that speaks to a lot of things we've, talked about before, like embracing new ideas, inclusivity, helping people, you know, to feel comfortable contributing again, accepting these um, expectations. So that's a great point. All right, now let's spend a few minutes talking specifically about working group conflict, and then um, we'll have the, the, um, video of with a case study and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so tips, there are some tips for resolving um, working group conflict. And this again, this content comes um, specific directly from IETF um, documents. I think it's on the resources page to where they specifically where this came from. But um, tips for working group chairs remain impartial. It's not the chair's role to take a side. It is your role to facilitate the conversation and get to the best outcome. Um, be clear when you are functioning as a contributor as opposed to your role as a working group chair. So these functions, they're separate and cannot happen or should not happen at the same time. And it's important to be clear um, with the working group um, on which role you are in at a particular time. And better yet, if there is um, an idea that you want to insert, it might be a, a good opportunity to have someone else insert it as opposed to you since you are serving as the, the working group chair. That helps to confuse the keep technical so when people get off track, emphasize the intended goals, um, whether that is in person or on the, the mailing list, it, that it is appropriate to do that in both places. And then get ahead of issues, alert the area director before things escalate, prevent um, dysfunctional conflict. De pre preventing dysfunctional conflict is the op um, op optimal outcome. Um, there's some recommended ways of managing disruptions on the IETF. One technique would be to take the interaction off the mailing list or offline. Sometimes issues can lose steam right when they're settled outside of the larger group. And then don't be afraid to get help if needed. The area director is there to provide the support that you need um, as a chair. And as a last resort, 
you can block posts, but just keep in mind this needs approval from the IESG. And hopefully this is not something that you um, need to do often or have had to do often. <clears throat> so here I want to just say a couple of things about face-to-face -face meetings. And I think it's um, divisive meetings will occur within the IETF. And in order to keep those on, on track, and be, it can be helpful to have a co-chair or secretary process manage the discussion mechanics. And this allows the chair to remain focused on moderating um, the, the discussion. So I think this is really a matter of, of having some help, not trying to do everything at, at one time and then listing others and supporting that. And you can control, the working group chair can control the process to a significant degree. The chair has the authority to refuse to grant the floor to participants for various reasons, um, such as people being unprepared, materials inappropriate, or someone is just being disruptive. Um, you have the authority to refuse to grant them the floor when those things are, are happening. Um, interim meetings um, can be a, a, a tool to resolve conflict um, related to recommendations. So design teams are a mechanism for resolving technical disputes. Um, they take the conflict offline in some respects and allow them to be resolved in a smaller group setting, which is sometimes helpful. Um, and when it's more important to make a decision than what the actual decision is, a coin toss can be used. And you will also see that in our, um, in our case study, and we'll get to that in a minute. Excuse me. And then experimental and internet drafts can be used as a last resort. This allows the market to make the decision. Um, IETF working group participants have working group recommendations. Um, and I'm just going to read this because uh, it is um, very, the context is very specific and the rationale is key. So I'm just going to read this. An individual may formally disagree with a working group recommendation based on the belief that either A, their own views have not been adequately considered, or B, the working group has made an incorrect technical choice that significantly jeopardizes the quality and or integrity of the working group product. Um, there is a process to follow when escalating a recommendation disagreement. It could be a process or technical error. Both are handled the same way, and there's an order of operations to the process. The first step is to discuss the disagreement with the working group or chairs, and if they can't resolve it, then it needs to be taken to the appropriate area director. And then involve the IESG if needed. If the AD can't resolve the issue, then the chair or individual can appeal. Um, and that should go to the IESG. And if the agreement cannot be resolved by the IESG, it can be escalated to the IAB. And the IAB is then the final decision. And I rushed through that a little bit because I want to make sure that you all have a few minutes, that you can see this um, case study and have a um, few minutes to um, to discuss it. So before we do that, though, just so you um, So, um, so Krishna, I used to be the chair of the software working group. Uh, I'm sorry. I want to tell you, I was trying to move to the questions first. So you are thinking about these questions before you hear the video. But the questions are, what was done well in getting to consensus in the SoftWires working group? And, and if there is there anything you would have done differently? And if so, what? Now I'm going to go back to this video. I'm going to stop sharing for a second, though. And then I'm going to reshare with the with the volume so you can, with the sound. And please let me know if you cannot, um, if you cannot hear it. Uh, so I'm um, Suresh Krishnan. I used to be the chair of the software working group. Um, so this was, I think in 2012. 
So August 2012, uh, it was the Vancouver ITF meeting. And uh, software was working on transition mechanisms from IPv4 to IPv6 and, and IPv6 to IPv4. So it was also looking at post transition. So when everything moved to v6 only, how would we provide v4 service? So uh, there's a couple of solutions that are knocking around the working group. So there are like three um, major things, like which are in the stateless space, like you know where you don't keep any state for the actual translation that's happening, whether it's NCAP or translation. Uh, so there's like three proposals. There's like um, map E, map D, and 4RD were the three proposals. And map is like mapping of address and ports. So what you do is pretty much you take like a subset of ports on an address and then you use that for, for transitioning between V4 and V6. And so there were like two variants of that. Like one of them was encapsulation based, so tunneling packets. Another one was like actual straight translation of the V6 into V4 packet and so on. And the working group had not like I made a choice of one of these to go forward. So um, one of the policies I was kind of pushing for was to kind of pick one and move with it, right? So to get the maximum deployment on that and um, and kind of like use the, publish the other ones as like a documentation and like informational or like experimental and so on. But the working group was not really ready to make the decision. So we really got stuck. So I kind of got a little bit, um, I would say frustrated a bit, right? And I started um, typing up some kind of questions um to kind of try to get some consensus in that meeting so we i kind of wanted to exit that meeting uh, with like one of the choices made but it was like kind of i would say like the uh, working group was like i would say kind of evenly split right like uh in some point like a little bit of less support for 4rd but like you know the other proposals are equally split and so i started putting the questions and i was trying to put the choices but people are saying hey <laughs> like uh you cannot have um map E and map T as separate choices because they're the same. And somebody else says, no, 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 you need to keep them the same because the same proposal with like two options. So like even very basic stuff, we couldn't make a progress. Like, so I couldn't even go to the questions anymore. So what I did is I had another question, which says like, do you consider map E and map T to be same or not, right? And uh, so, so we can either go to a two choice question or a three choice question to see where we go forward. And again, like the consensus, like the group was like split exactly in the middle. So like people, how the people thought it's like they should be the same proposal and like you know just go against 4rd and another half thought like they should be two and they should each go separately so i decided okay so i talked to the ad who was in the room which was ralph from so was the ad at the time so i told ralph like ralph this is not going anywhere so i'm gonna just like toss a coin because like the group is split like whatever we do like you know we're gonna get a solution today so ralph like we talked discussed a little bit and ralph said fine so i just reached out into my pocket on the only coin that I had, uh, it was a $2 Canadian coin, you know, the bimetal coin that we had, and I tossed the coin. So uh, between map E and map T being the same solution or separate solutions for the sake of the choice. And so the uh, choice ended up being uh, map T, so the, I think it was tails, I'm not sure, <laughs> but, but I think it was tails. And it, um, I think there's a video hanging around with like Mark Townsley who has it, but probably, but it, 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 it was tails and like Mappy and Mappy are supposed to be two different solutions. Then I actually did a call to um, choose between Mappy, Mappy and 4RD. And then Mappy had like, you know, the maximum support again to be confirmed on the mailing list. But I put everything in the slide. So if you actually go and look in the proceedings for that meeting, you're going you're gonna to find my slides that I was actually furiously typing. So I uploaded them to the proceedings so people can actually see how the thing progressed, at least where it progressed to. And at the end, like Mappy, like was the uh, consensus document to move forward on standards track. And then um, in a separate question, I decided the other quest, other um, proposals, the Mappy and 4RD would become experimental specs, like we publish what we did. So that's kind of how it ended up. So yeah, we successfully made them into RFCs and they're looking good progress. I think you're muted, Joanna. Yes, sorry about that. So what was done, it, you actually at this point, you can provide any thoughts. You don't have to answer these questions, but they are just meant to prompt the conversation. What was done well? 
and getting to consensus on the soft wires working group? And is there anything you would have done differently? If so, what? But again, feel free to, you know, mention any aspects of, of what you heard here. Uh, to me, what stands out is I think this kind of thing could only work if all parties are equally frustrated and they have to sort of have this because otherwise this would have definitely lead to an appeal or or more delay the process because of that. So this has to be like before we do the toy cows, people are sort of agreeing that like, you know, yes, we have tried the normal process. There's enough frustration in the group that we need to move on. It's not just the chairs thinking that we need to move on, but even the parties needs to think that, yes, a decision needs to be made now. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Everybody has to be <laughs> they're ready to move on. That's an interesting um, point. Any, with, any other thoughts on this? Uh, I like the this the fact that the uh, person in the video was repeatedly saying that a decision has to be made today, because uh, I do see that, uh, I guess a lot of the times people just keep discussing and discussing and there's actually so many viewpoints they can just keep discussing. So I think just actually setting a deadline for the decision like today uh, was good and it forced creative solutions. Mm Yeah, I thought that was in, oh, interesting. Go ahead. Um, yeah, person not in favor of like coin flip type of decisions because you don't know which one is better than the other. You are relying on a chance. Um, I do like the approach that you have uh, experimental drafts and let the market decide which one will take up. So coming up with a resolution which is more well-defined as better than coin flip. I was just wondering here that we do have options to go to IAB if AD is not able to decide why that wasn't done before the coin flip. I was just curious. Uh, Kiran, uh, the IAB comes in the play only in the appeal process. Otherwise, I don't think so. We usually involve the IAB in the normal one running of the working group there, we have to talk to our ADs and maybe if a, a bigger decision is needed than ISG, but in the normal process, I don't think so we will involve the IAB. Okay. Uh, and uh, in general, like, you know, when we think of like, uh, in some people would feel like, we, uh, like just taking a negative thing to multiple experimental RFCs, the negative to do would be have we failed that's why like you know as if, as if we are giving up and that's why we are writing multiple experimental because we are not able to meet a resolution and maybe our job in itf is to actually come up with internet standards that's the most important thing output for us so that everybody implements the same thing moment we go with multiple solutions we add to more complexity i know in some cases we have to do it and we have done it successfully in the past for instance, OSPF, ISIS is the prime example of that. But uh, in some cases, we have to think that maybe coin toss is better uh, mm -hmm. for the industry overall, not so much for the proponents of the ideas, but where we get one single standard to be implemented and interoperated everywhere. Mm -hmm. So just to compare to what you put there. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone else have any, um, we, we're one, one minute left, any other thoughts or comments? One thing that comes to my mind is like, you know, we, we do foster, uh, like, you know, people should be able to communicate. We kind of always suggest that give more comments, give more comments. We are looking for feedback. But sometimes what happens is those comments also gives opportunity for some people to exploit it. And sometimes the conversations in ITF uh, goes into almost uh, what we can nowadays call gaslighting, that you are just bringing up random things 
into the conversation and it's very difficult for even as a chairs to you can do this much better in a uh, in a face to face conversation but very difficult to do it on mailing list uh, mm. when somebody at least from your point of view you feel is just dragging the conversation and it is not just being a good participant and you can't shut it down as well because the person would immediately say oh you don't want the negative comments to be posted and it's my right to uh like you know give proper feedback on the mailing list uh so it that part i've seen like you no know, very hard to handle in a good conflict resolution so if other people have any ideas uh that would be really good to hear this is jane just um to to follow on to drew's comment about um the these arguments that keep being brought up, what I liked about Suresh's solution um, it was to have the other solutions be documented. So um, this prevents uh, more conflict in the future because if somebody says, well, have you thought about map E or, or whatever the solution was that ended up being labeled experimental, you can point to a document and say, yes, it was considered. Um, it now a, a working group perhaps could like create, say, like a tombstone um, document where they said we considered this and we decided it was the wrong way to solve the problem. These were the issues we found with the solution. We're not pursuing it further, but it gets documented. Um, so it can be pointed to when somebody says, oh, have you thought about this? I may have lost a little bit of what Jean said. My internet's a little unstable. Um, did, did, did anybody have anything else to add or any comment to that? No, I so. kind of I agree with what uh, Jean was providing. And in fact, we have done that. Uh, like we have in fact published some RFCs and informational RFCs, which is all about like, you know, the most, uh, misunderstood questions about our protocol and which is where they, these questions keep coming in and we kind of did maintain that uh, in fact published as an informational RFC. Initially we were putting it in a wiki but when we liked our content we were like this is worth even publishing as an RFC so I agree that like you know it's good to uh, get things documented and put and like point out point to people to that so that we can just avoid the same conversation over and over again. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a good tool that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, um, everyone. Oh, um, there's another comment in the chat to, to support what Daru said from an operations point of view, one decision and one standard is sometimes better than a list of op options. But yes, documenting the other option is good too. Thank you, um, everyone. Um, I kind of had a feeling we would get to the end of time, but please remember to um, take the survey um, that will come to you in the email. I hope that this was um, a productive and helpful conversation, and I'd love to um, hear your feedback in the survey so we can continue to um, improve um, these trainings. So thank you and have a good rest of your day, afternoon, or evening.